Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of No One's a Critic. I'm Kino, joined as always by Mac. Um, and how are you doing, Mac, since the last time we talked, which was actually in person? Uh, we were, we were just coming off of our Calling All Sopranos fans event that we did in New York um, with another creator, Stephanie from Sopranos Blueprint. Uh, that video, I'll link that video in the description of this one if you guys want to check it out. But we actually met up in New York. So how, how are you after that trip? I'm good. Um, after I left the bar that we watched a UFC, was it the middleweight championship? We watched a UFC three, three Oh three. I think it's, is the number we watched it, which it was uh Drikas Duplessis versus Israel Adesanya, which was awesome. I had a great time. I'm a huge UFC fan and it was really cool to watch it uh, with you at that. It was bar. a really, it was a really good fight too. It like, it was it, cause like some fights are just kind of like, you know, um, I saw a couple of like, you know, McGregor's old fights where they're just kind of like over in two seconds. Like, okay, Did, didn't he win one of his titles like within like 10 seconds or something? What, what his his big fight or, that propelled him to fame was against uh, Jose Aldo. Uh, he knocked him out in, yeah, like less than a minute. Um, and it was really exciting in the sense that like, oh my God, he knocked his, and Jose Aldo was like a champ. He was like legit. Um, but that it was, it was, it was McGregor's like, uh, shit talking. Seconds. It was like his shit talking that, um, he got into his head and the guy just charged him. And, and that's really been McGregor's like ace in the hole. It's like getting in his opponent's head and like messing with them. I don't, I don't like Conor McGregor that much. I think he's kind of overrated, but he's had some very impressive accomplishments over his career. Yeah, it, it was 13 seconds. Yeah, it's like it's it's interesting. It's cool from like a, you know, uh, strategic or just like standpoint, like after the fact, like, oh, it's cool. Like, oh, I got him in 13 seconds. Uh, but it's just like disappointing from uh, I've been waiting all night for this. And I watched like four other like random fights. And then I it took oh 13 seconds. Like, OK. Well, I, I will um, say it when it ends in a knockout, that's I mean, that's still pretty exciting when it goes to, when it when it's like a like a, a 25 minute grappling match that oh, ends in rolling in decision, on the floor, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when people start to get kind of bored. It's like, oh, my God. Um, like, but when on, some guys. guy gets knocked out or submitted, it's it's still a, it's it's a good night. You're like, damn, this is uh, the 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 light heavyweight champ right now is this guy, uh, Alex uh, Pajera. Uh, Poetan is his nickname. It's a. Uh, like a Brazilian native American for like fists of stone. And he's knocked out like so many guys like w within like a minute, like if he touches you, you die. So he's, he's great. I love him. And uh, he's fighting in three Oh seven. It was three Oh five that we watched, not three Oh three. I take that back. It was three Oh five. He's in like two fights. I'm really excited to see his next fight. He's, he's awesome. Yeah, I remember, well, because I remember the um, for Conor McGregor, I remember that fight. But then I also remember when he lost to Nate Diaz, um, and that was a that was a brawl. They were like both bloody, and I was like, "Hell yeah, brother!" Let's Dude, go. When, when Nate Diaz um, like has blood all over, he wins. He's got blood all over his face, and mm -hmm. he like he's like you know, like showing off to the camera. It's like one of the sickest moments in, in UFC history. It's funny, too, because like Nate wasn't even like he was, I mean, he was in like good shape, but like not compared to like, you know, all the other UFC fighters who have like ripped six packs. Nate Diaz almost kind of looked like a normal dude compared to them. Yeah, but Nate but. Diaz, though, like one, he's got cardio for days like you, he, he will never tire out. And the dude you can take a beating like he's gotten like just beat up so much in his career that. He's just, I mean, one of the toughest guys out there, like legit. Um, yeah, he, the Diaz brothers are awesome. Um, but yeah, so we watched that in that bar and then I went home and I got like maybe like four hours sleep. But then I had to leave for a JFK to get home. And that was a whole day affair. That was like an odyssey. Did you get stuck? Stuck? At the at the airport? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, well, you know, when I when I went to JFK, it was kind of rainy and shitty, um, but we, we took off no problem. Um, I got stuck there, dude. Like I, I I was telling this on stream the other day, but um, I got stuck at JFK. We spent 24 hours in the airport. <gasps> uh, we had to we had to sleep there overnight. Um, it was awful, dude. I was like, why? Because of the weather? Because of the weather. The storm a storm blew in when we were supposed to take off. When did um, you when we did were you guys leave? To, we were supposed to leave around like four. Um, but it, just... yeah, yeah, you, you got, 
you you got a good time getting out ahead. Uh, I got out we were of flying there. to Chicago too, uh, but yeah, it was it was so awful, and it was oh. it was such a fun trip. But the ending of the trip was so awful. Like we spent That's... 24 hours in the airport. Like it was gross. Screw that. It's funny because I actually at one point because I didn't want to get up at like you know 4 a.m. to get to JFK. It really wasn't that bad. I, I it was pretty smooth. Um, but um. I almost tried to find a later flight. I'm like, oh, I'll sleep in a few more hours. And at the last minute, I'm just like, yeah, screw it. I'll just take have a coffee and get up. Um, so thank God I didn't. Damn. Yeah, no, you got you got it lucky. And, and Stephanie got back to, to Florida uh, really easily. So yeah, we were the only ones who got caught there. Um, but we made it home. You know, it was fine. And it was still a very, very fun trip. And uh, if any of you who are watching were there in person, that was really cool to, to meet um, some of our fans. But... Um, yeah, glad to be back home and back to doing the normal routine, including this podcast. So uh, what are we, what's the topic this week, Mac? You've got a topic for us to discuss. Well, despite our lovely time in New York, I am very pissed off um, over the last several weeks because there has been a sort of a um, um, lot of discourse. I mean, this has like been kind of ongoing discourse. Um, but last night we saw Strange Darling. Um, have you heard of it? No, is that is that a new film that just came out? New film that came out. Um, I would recommend just look it up and go see it. It's a film that you really need to see blind. It is awesome. It's made for like four million. Um, hope I really hope it does well. It really deserves it. Excellent film. Um, however, and this will kind of segue into what I wanted to, to talk about. But um, so the film was shot entirely on thirty five millimeter film, uh, which is cool. However. Uh, the film opens with a title card saying shot entirely on 35 millimeter film. And me and my wife were both sitting there and we both kind of went, uh, we have seen, uh, we go to a, whenever uh, music box theater here in Chicago, they show a lot of 35 millimeter screenings. It's really cool, especially seeing the film on like actual film. Um, it's really cool. It's a different experience. Uh, so we love that. However, uh, th there is something to be said where I think, you know, the whole film versus digital thing has kind of gotten really annoying. Um, another example of that is CGI versus practical effects. Um, I think there is something to be said about, you know, shooting on film has film has a certain grain to it that can be really cool. Uh, it can really tell when you're watching the film as opposed to digital, which has more of like a sleeker look. Um, and then of course, CGI and practical effects. However, I think it, it, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, whatever looks best should be the king. However, there's sort of like a subset of, I, I think you mentioned it before we started uh, film Twitter. If you, if, or, you know, that's sort of like innocuous term for it um, where people sort of like jerk off too much over like, Oh, it's shot on 35 millimeter. Oh, practical effects i don't know i think that's kind of silly it's just a little strange to me yeah i i think that like well there's a couple of ways to look at it um do i think that film looks better than digital generally speaking yeah i think so do i think it's it's that big of a deal no it's sort of like the difference between um vinyl versus like digital streaming it's like does does your vinyl record sound better than spotify yes it does is it so much better to justify buying a record player and buying the expensive vinyls? Like, no, not really. Like streaming is just so convenient. And, and I apologize if you hear my dog behind no, me no worries. tearing, <laughs> tearing up her toy, but um, like it's, there, there's a convenience thing where it's like, um, it, it's just, I don't know. It's just like, like say, the same thing with like Blu-rays and stuff. Like people kind of jerk off about like, blu-rays and i and i am someone who values like physical media like just so you own it because because then it's not being taken off of streaming sites or sensor or anything like that but at the same time it's it's just so convenient that like it the the level of how much better it is doesn't justify like me getting out the dvd player and putting the dvd in and, and that's that's how i kind of look at film versus digital it's like i i do think film looks better and more so practical effects i think those 
vastly look better than than CGI, even when they're not as good. Like there's just something about it being a practical thing that like, oh, it just it feels better than looking at a CGI image. Um, do I think it justifies the huge cost that goes into practical effects for some things? Yes. For other things, no. Like for, for some stuff, it's like, yeah, just fix it up and post. Um, the problem, though, that a lot of people bring up about like this stuff is that like CGI has become more so not just like a tool to like fix up small stuff very easily. It's become like a crutch that a lot of filmmaking relies on now where it's just like like the Star Wars prequels were a perfect example of this where it's like the entire thing is CGI. Like there's no... Even even when they could have built a set and filmed on set, they're just like, nah, do it in front of a green screen and like we'll CGI it all in later. And it's like it it, it looks worse as a result. So um I don't I don't hate digital stuff if it's being used right. Um, but when it's being used as a crutch in some cases to just be like, Yeah, we'll just we'll pay, you know, a software person to do it later instead of doing it ourselves, that's when I think it becomes a problem. I think that was, um, isn't there that famous clip? I'm looking at it now of um, Ian McKellen on the set of uh, The Hobbit where he like broke down because literally he's sitting in a a green room. It's like literally, he's not even surrounded by the actors. Um, it's very, and like that, and that was the whole thing with uh, um, the original trilogy was that they, used a lot of practical effects with like, you know, forced perspective and whatnot. Um, and for the most part, it worked pretty, although the original films did awful, obviously use a lot of CGI to sort of like to emphasize or to aid it. You know, there were not, there were certain things they just simply could not do practically. But the core of it was more. practical and you can, and, and you can feel it a lot more than again, the Hobbit films are much more CGI focused. The, uh, the star Wars prequel. It's just, it's like, if they feel fake, um, but I, I agree with you going back to the topic we were, we we're talking about, which is that like, I think film people like jerk themselves off too much to, to some of this stuff. It's like a film, a film isn't, I, does it, does the film look a little bit better? Sure. But does the fact that it's like filmed on 35 millimeter, make it a better film? No, not necessarily. It comes down to like the writing and the cinematography and the effects and all that stuff. And I don't, yeah, I agree with you. Having that description at the beginning of the film is very like, it, it's like pretentious. It's like, I, like, I don't know. It's just like, show, it, it's like showing off like, Hey, film bros. Like we're, 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 we're doing the meme. We're, 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 we're going along with the, the talking points here, which, and again, I, I didn't see the film, so I can't comment on it, but it, you know, they, they, they might have had their own valid reasons, but um, yeah, I think oh, I I don't think th there's like I, I mean it's a great film. Um, the f you can kind of tell it was there is a certain grain to it. It looked because it's kind of emulating the sort of like you know horror exploitation of films of the seventies, um, and it comes up. You can tell that it, it looks really good. I mean, well, granted, like t only to an extent because you know we uh, it. it you know, it said shot on 35 millimeter. Great, but it's still we're seeing it in digital, um, which is why we like going to music box sometimes when they actually show the 35 millimeter screenings. I'm seeing a couple 70 millimeter later uh, this month, uh, Vertigo and the Master. Um, however, to your point, what, what sort of bugs me about this discourse is that not so much like does film look better? Yes. In, in general, I think it's like a, it's a sharper image. There's a lot of um, there's something like a crispness, crispness to it that is just sometimes I, you can't really get with digital. Um, however, I think that what bugs me is that, yeah, it's if it looks better for what you're going for, then you should use it. However, there is no merit in simply using it because so like, for example, um, The Social Network is a film that was shot completely on digital. However, I'm, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure, right? I uh, mean, I don't know that off the top of my head, yeah. but... Um, let, me, let me make sure. Uh, I mean, I think just digitally? just going off my memory of how the film looks, I imagine it was all digital, but... I believe so. Uh, I mean, it's also, it's also a film about... It's a film about tech people, so, so it kind of makes sense, you know? It, so that is exact... So that is my 
exactly where that is a film where it the digital look to it really meshes with everything going on everything's very it's not supposed to be overly ex, ex, expressionist you know impressionist sorry um it's not supposed to if it was shot like a noir film it'd be kind of weird it's supposed to be this very like almost flat very digitally looking and so in that case oh it wasn't shot in film like no but the digital really aids to what the film is going for um another perfect example someone mentioned um someone actually made a joke they were like imagine like a 4k restoration of the blair witch project um which it, well exactly because it's like oh wow it's in 4k but it's like well that doesn't it's kind of silly that someone even mentioned the best way to watch that movie is like on the shittiest VHS tape you can find because that the shittiness to it really adds to the feeling that you're watching this found footage of these kids. Um, well, cause like, and that's another issue too, is like all the found footage films you see nowadays are like, they're filmed with like a $5,000 camera. So it's kind of like, okay. Um, oh yeah, sure. You're just an amateur photographer running around, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I think, you could go down this rabbit hole of like, you know, how, how, how shitty do you want it to look versus like, you know, it aids in the story of the Blair Witch Project, but it, it also, you know, needs to be a movie that people can watch. I, there was a, I saw a comment one time from someone on a video where they were talking about um, uh, this horror movie that they were watching. Um, it was like an experimental horror film and it was on VHS and slowly the the image was starting to fade out um, over the course. And by the end, it just kind of like faded out and stopped. And they thought that was part of the film. They thought, oh, my God, this is like part of the movie. Um, it's brilliant, like, you know, brilliant kind of work on their part. But it turns out it was actually their VHS was just wearing <laughs> out over time. Um, so That's I think, cool. you know, sometimes you can sometimes you could read a little bit too much into some of this stuff. But um no, I agree with you that like, d does it matter for a lot of films? Probably not. Um, and and there is something to be said of like, there there's a kind of intentionality that comes with with shooting on film because it's so expensive and because it's so like time consuming to process and do all that stuff. All your shots have to be more like you don't have time to just film everything like you do on digital and just kind of figure out what works. That's what they also say about. Um, uh, film photography too versus just taking a digital picture it's like you no know, you can't just snap a million shots hoping that one of them turned out okay you have to really like com compose your shots and think about it because you only get like one or two shots um at this bait with with the film so um i mean there, there's a give and take in all of this stuff but there's also like a you know we we want to try to make things as practical and easy as possible um, it just streamlines and makes it makes production easier. So, um, yeah, I think I think that th there, there's a give and a take in all this stuff and there's a time and a place for it all. Um, but I think. Film film Twitter can be very pretentious about a about a lot of stuff, not just the, the techniques and stuff like this, but oftentimes just in like what, you know, what films are and what films like people are like allowed to like and stuff like that. Yeah, well, it's if, just to touch upon what you mentioned, I really do agree uh, with the film. Uh, one thing that really bugs me, and this is another um, another kind of, you know, kind of folds into the pretentiousness of it. Um, there was, do you remember when certain films would be given black and white releases? I think they did that with Logan. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that? Uh, they did it with Parasite. Uh Bong Jun Ho's Parasite, and they did it with uh, Godzilla minus one, Godzilla minus mm. one minus color. I actually haven't seen, I haven't seen Godzilla minus one yet. I need to get around. I think it's, it's on good Netflix. Film. I gotta, yeah, it's I good really film. have to give it a shot. Um, however, what really bugs me about that is so actually, Godzilla minus one actually might be a um, a an exception because what i have heard is that that film they actually go to great they don't just throw like a black and white filter over it mm. they actually go in and like make it seem like you know they try to mimic the old godzilla yeah. films yeah however i did watch the logan black and white uh cut and it just kind of was like 
why are we doing it? Like, what, it's just what, the, what? they just turn down the saturation and just like why? What? Like why? What? What? What does that add to the film? It doesn't. Um, and I think, but, but it makes people, that, it makes people who are into this film stuff be like, it's black and white. So that means it's a deeper movie because it's in black and white. But see, here's what, this is what bugs me. Um, and this is where I, where I get really mad at these kind of people as someone who is, I would say somewhat, you know, I, I've, I've passed the, uh, my Dunning Kruger arc. Yeah, I am yeah. down here where I realize I don't know shit, even though yeah. I probably, I think I know a good amount of film and film oh, history. Yeah. When you actually watch a lot of those old noir films or even films, uh, you know, German impressionist films, um, to your point, they were extreme. They used black and white to oh, yeah. like the highest advantage, like yeah. the shadows. It wasn't just like, oh, we're just shooting it in black and white film. It's like, no, yeah. the the colors, the contrast, it was like stark and striking and it was oh, ver- yeah. used very intentionally, um, the shadows and whatnot. And, and, and modern films people, are really missing that. And I think a lot of people, even f- some modern films that I've seen that were shot in, you know, yeah. that weren't just like slapped over, but yeah. even shot in black and white. I'm like, I feel like there's a. The lighting a, isn't there. It's you're not really using the yeah. black and white medium. I, I yeah. almost consider it a different medium than color film to yeah. some extent. I, I mean, where, they're just like using like an Instagram filter, basically. Um, it kind of feels like that. And I'm like, and then the question is like, well, why are we doing this? Like, what's what are we doing here? You know, it's a great example. You know what? I know exactly what you're talking about. And I often whenever I see modern stuff that's filmed black and white, I'm like, it doesn't look as good as the like the classic noir era for that exact reason. One thing I saw recently that I was like, oh, that actually, like, it looks really good. Uh, this is going to sound so stupid, but my wife was watching The Vampire Diaries. Um, and there's an episode that, like, I don't know the story because she was just watching. And I wasn't really paying attention to the story. But there's an episode that takes place, I think, in someone's head. It might be a dream or something. But it's it's um, it's um it takes place in, like like, a noir type, like, like they almost go back in time and they're all dressing like noir and like it's 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 shot the episode is in black and white and i was blown away by the lighting i was like the, like whoever did this that episode really understood noir lighting it was very striking it was it looked really good and that was one of the, the few modern examples that i was like oh yeah they didn't just film this normally and then turn the the saturation down they like legit um Maybe maybe I'll try to see if I can find a clip on YouTube, although I don't even know what to search up, honestly, but I'll, I'll maybe I'll throw it on here real quick. But um, it was like I was like really impressed by that. But, yeah, it's definitely a rarity. And again, just just making something black and white doesn't make it better. <laughs> that's like that's like a stereotypical like uh, photographer thing where they're like, uh, oh, it's shot in black and white. So that means my image is deep. And it's like, no, no, it doesn't. It particularly bothered me with. um uh, the parasite one because I don't know if Bong Joon Ho is involved, but I just remember thinking like, what's so interesting about Parasite was, you know, I mean Bong Joon Ho is such an incredible filmmaker. The colors of the film were so stark, you know. There was uh, like just is it like have you have you seen Parasite? Oh, okay, definitely check it out if you can. But it, it basically it's a sort of like a semi like drama thriller kind of. It's hard to. It's it, it sort of had the genre classify. Um, I, I, I kind of know about it, but I just haven't actually watched it. Uh, but so it, one of the main themes is sort of, uh, you know, class consciousness, like class, you know, conflict. And uh, the families, the rich families home, they have a yard and the yard is just like almost it's almost like unnaturally green. But I but this seems very intentional where it's supposed to give this feeling of like this, like, you know, green paradise of almost unnaturally so that the other family the poor family will never attain in their entire lives and so yeah then you watch it in black and white you're like okay well that you're we're missing that aspect you like you shot it on color you made your choices and your lighting choices why are we doing this um there was one like one exception would be i don't know if you've if you saw it there's um i think you can find it online the director, Steven, Steven Soderbergh, he actually took um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Steven Spielberg film, and he put it in black and white. And Oh, I saw out, that. Yeah, actually, I know you saw that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But however, 
um, he wasn't doing that to say, oh, this is better. He was doing it as an experiment to show, to kind of like illustrate how brilliant Spielberg's blocking was, which especially in like, you know, it's amazing how if you watch like Raiders or Jaws and you pay attention to that, um, the blocking in those films is like, Unbel- like even the cinematography is unbelievable but you almost take those for granted because the it's they're almost like genre films they're almost it's he, yeah he he's a film Spielberg's a filmmaker where like if you love his films really go back and rewatch them very closely because it's like insane um yeah so to, to kind of wrap it back around I, I really hate that vibe of um these pretentious film bros another what really triggered me today was um and it may have been a troll however this has been like a a very consistent thing that i've seen is when say an actor you know the you know the letterbox top four uh i i yeah you could set your top four on letterbox oh well, well yes but also like uh interviewers will like from letterboxd they'll like go to red carpet events and they'll ask actors and filmmakers their top four films and they'll post it on youtube and it's really cool um however there's always comments of people like oh this actor just named these four like you know some of them are foreign films or some of them are old films they're just doing it to be pretentious um and what's really ironic is that i feel like there is this stereotype of the film bro is someone who says like oh my four favorite films are these like four italian films from the 1920s or like you know whatever um however it's so weird because like even as someone who went to film school who's kind of been in this community like you know tangentially i guess um i don't see that nearly it, it it happens but i don't see that nearly as much as people who mock this like straw man of the film bro the the people i see are the ones who like have only seen like 50 to 100 movies in their life and like watch or like obsessed with marvel and disney shit who think they're like the authority on like film and that shit like drives me. and then they're making fun of like oh all french films are boring and like dry and everyone's just smoking and it's like that is not even close it kind of comes off as almost like racist or like or xenophobic at least too. It's like all oh, these Italian films are just like them whining. It's like, no man, like that's such a, like you're making such a huge presumption about an entire nation's, you know, cinema history. Uh, South Korea, for example, is like, like unbelievable film catalog there. Um, you, like was thriller, it, there was something recently, movie. there was something recently about, um, uh jenna ortega people uh winona Ryder was talking about um how none of the young people on stranger thing none of the young actors like watched any film like they just like they're actors but they're not really into like film and stuff and 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 the one the one example like that she said of an actress or a young actor who like was talking to her about like movies from like the 60s and stuff was uh jenna ortega and a lot of people were, you know, being like, oh, yeah, that's why she's the she's based. Uh, the other reason is because uh, she talks shit about Hollywood writers, which a lot of people really liked her for. I really like her for that. Um, but other people were like, oh, you know, she's just pretentious or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And again, it, it, went, it went back to this discourse where it feels like on Twitter, especially there's only two types of movie people. There's like the pretentious film Twitter people who are into like really obscure stuff for just the reason being obscure and then there's the people who it's like they only like marvel and disney um and view any view anything other than that as kind of an attack on them it's like if you like something other than those things it's like you're kind of attacking them you're a lot of people do attack them let me be clear a lot of people absolutely do attack the the marvel disney watchers which i think is kind of shitty just because, I mean, we talked about this before, like, you know, watch whatever movies you want. There's no, there, there's no, you're not better than anyone for, for liking a different movie, you know? Like, I'm sure, I'm sure book readers, like, look down on movie watchers for basically being like, you people are arguing about fil- film when, you know, you're too dumb to even read a book. Um, so, 
Like th- there's no better or worse than any. No, no one's better or worse than anyone else for uh, for liking stuff. Um, and you, I don't know. You shouldn't. You shouldn't make it an attack. Like you should. Like you, this shouldn't be your identity. And I, I, I say that with some level of irony, because like for you and me both, media is kind of our identity in the sense that like we're content creators about film and television. So this this does kind of become wrapped up in our persona. But um, I don't know. A lot of this stuff is just like it's just exhausting to just even like keep track of it. Um, although I did I did want to bring something up. Uh, I, I, I'm looking off screen because I'm looking through your YouTube post history. Didn't you post your t- your uh, your your letter bro your letter or letterbox uh, top four? Uh, I think I, I don't know if I posted my top four. I just, a couple. Oh, weeks I see. Ago, oh, I, I found it here. Oh Is wait, no, I think, I think I think no, I think you were memeing on this one. You posted Speed Two. Oh yeah, that Salo, was a <laughs> Aloha and Drumline. Yeah, that was a meme. Um, uh, what what is, what is let's let's go through this since we, we, we can mock each other. What's what's your uh, your letterbox top four? So right now, let me go to let me go to it. Uh, I don't even so know I if have, I have it on. Letterboxd. I have my top 16 list, um, but doesn't letterbox like you have like a top four like on your account? You can put your top four. Yeah. So let me see what I can't look it up on. I don't know why the desktop isn't working. Uh, let me pull up you my need phone. To sign in. I need to sign into mine, too. I um, have. So I have a top 16, like those are like my top 16, like favorite films. Um, but my top four would be uh, Amadeus. I, that's my go to film, my favorite of all time. Um, then I have Half Nelson, uh, which is a lot of people may not have seen it. Ryan Gosling actually got his first Oscar nomination for it in 2006. Um, it's a really it's an independent film, very small, low budget. It's about he plays a middle school teacher who's nursing a crack addiction. And he one of his students who he, who discovers that he has this addiction, but, you know, keeps his secret. He finds her. He finds um, that she's being roped into like the drug trade. Anthony Mackie's in it, who's great in it. This is before Marvel. Um, he's excellent in it. And he tries to help her. But, you know, it's it's kind of like a parody, not parody, but sort of like a subversion of the white savior trope where the white teacher saves the young black girl. Um, but in this side of the story, the white teacher is a crack addict. So he's like trying to help her, but he keeps fucking up and it becomes a, it, it, it becomes less about like, oh, the white teacher saving the black girl and more about these two people sort of like just connecting over it. It's a really well done movie. Um my third is Michael Clayton. Have you ever seen Michael Clayton? Fuck yeah, bro. I, I heard of that film and I've heard <gasps> good You've stuff. You've not I seen it? See, nah. No. Bro, get I, you on know what? that. I, I, I talked about this before, but a lot of people like pointed out that like even though my name, like my online name is Pierre Kino, I, I'm actually not that much of a movie guy. Like I'm much more in like the television world. I actually didn't know that um, Kino was specifically meant to refer to film specifically i thought it just kind of meant like like oh that food's kino i, I thought well, it it, that's like, that's the meme that's the yeah. meme of it like it kino is like the german and russian word for cinema like a uh, kino matography like you know that it's like just their word for it over there and then people used it as a meme to basically like film people used it as a meme to be like i don't watch movies i watch cinema I don't cinema. watch films. Yeah. I watch keen. Like, you know, it's just like, it's a pretentious thing. I don't watch. Can I? Shit. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and, All right. and then I, I adopted the name, like ironically, that was, it was a joke when I first, I kind of regret, I, I would, I would have named myself something a little bit different probably if I knowing what I know now, but regardless, that's my identity, but okay. So you, we just did two. What's your other two? Or no, um, yeah, it's a, the third one. What's your fourth? Amadeus, half Nelson, uh, Michael Clayton, it's like best maybe one of the best legal thrillers the script is amazing just awesome tilda swinton george clooney is like he's all right he he plays the role good he's kind of playing himself but excellent um and my last would be la confidential right now um on that's on the movie fucking rules and I, I did a video on true detective season two when i realized that 
it kind of ripped off LA Confidential. So um, Unforgiven is also a film that usually sneaks into my top four at some point. That's good. All right. So my top four, and again, me not being as much of a movie guy as you, um, Once Upon a Time in the West is my all-time favorite film. I just think it's like a perfect, yeah, perfect film. Um, Training Day, I that's my like hell yeah movie. I I just I love Training Day so that, much. It kicks so much ass. That's a perfect example of a movie where like you know we're when I'm you know sort of like a brand of you know um, YouTube discourse is like you know pointing out like uh, realism and like plot holes and whatnot in films and like if it doesn't if it isn't consistent in that regard it's a bad movie. Training Day, I think, is a film that everyone should watch to kind of prove that wrong. Because on paper, that movie is fucking ridiculous. That is like, that is insane. The amount of shit that happens and like what is supposed to like be like, probably like, like not even a full, like 15 hours. Um, but it just rocks. It's just so, it you don't even think about that because you're getting so caught up. I didn't even think about how crazy the plot is until I showed it to a friend and she was like, what the fuck is happening in this movie? And then I was like, Everything oh, you're happens. right. This is actually <laughs> this is actually kind of insane what's happening here from the very beginning. Actually, you don't you don't even notice it at first because you're just so drawn in by Denzel's like charisma that you're just like from the very beginning. He's a psychopath, like from like his first instant. You just kind of don't notice it because he just he kicks so much ass. He just uh, and then yeah, I think Ethan Hawke is really the Ethan Hawke's incredible. Um, I I don't know some of the, the 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 smiley the Mexicans at the end I thought were a little bit like oh, yeah. these don't really strike me as L A Mexicans, but um, but even the the performances were still so good. I'm kind of it's like, just so good. Yeah. And it's like yeah, <laughs> two goes in it from Breaking Bad. Um, anyway, kicks ass. Uh, my third film is No Country for Old Men. I mean, Fuck yeah, dude. just a credible movie. And then the controversial one is Reservoir Dogs, which I know we've discussed how you don't like that one. But I, for me, it's like, I just love it. It's like, it, it's Tarantino at his rawest for me. And I, I love it. I, I It's my favorite of his films. Yeah, well, I think or the kind of not, I, I don't spend too much time on it, but like, it's not so much that... Uh for me that I don't necessarily I don't not like Reservoir Dogs. I do think it is a bit, it, I think it's a film very much of its time in terms of like for when it was first released, holy fuck, this was like a grenade in like the film, the independent film cinema. This was like, although it does kind of bug me that the film is heralded as sort of like defining independent cinema when really the only reason it got made was because Harvey Keitel you know, I, not to say that like, not to say that like an independent film can't have big stars in it. That's like one of the main ways that independent cinema can kind of get a leg up. But I think like it is strange that like this is like the cornerstone of independent cinema, and this cast is like star studded as fuck. <laughs> like it's got like Harvey Keitel. It's, got, it's just like it is, and like even and not just to say like, oh, this is before they were big. Like no, it actually had a lot of like very. Well, Harvey well Keitel, actor. Harvey Keitel definitely was big. I think the other guys were not as like Tim Roth was not big when this came out. Um, uh, Michael, Steve, Steve Buscemi, I think was he was known. He was um, he was he was on the up, but he was not the huge huge star he was today. Um, Michael Madsen. Michael um, Madsen. I I don't think he was big when this came out. Um, I don't know, he, but yeah, but uh, we'll see. I don't think he, he wasn't like huge, but like he was in like The Natural, The Doors, Thumb on the Wheeze. Yeah, they, I like, mean, they were they were legitimate actors. And and Harvey yeah. Keitel was the reason the film got made. Um, but I mean, you got to give it to Tarantino. I mean, he was like working at like a like a like a film, like a like a VHS store, like a Suncoast yeah. video or something when this came out. So or or before I mean the film, he got picked up by by Harvey. But um it just kind of I just, I just love it. I just like, I love the film. Oh no, it's still a fun, great watch. Um, it just bugs me that some people are like, it's like, well, this was kind of like of all the independent. This is a very almost like Cinderella story case of this it, and Kevin way. Smith, uh, Clerks. I think are the two think, are the two films that define '90s indie cinema. I think that's a perfect example where Clerks is like sort of the antithesis, not the antithesis, but like more of a 
the spirit of like what independent cinema movement was trying to do of just like, Oh, I can't get studio backing. I can't find a star to star in this. Fuck you. I'm going to make this movie by myself and it's going to be a huge hit. I think clerks. And that's another film that I think almost rewatching it. Does it really hold up? No, not really. It's kind of, it's pretty janky. No, I, I, I mean, I, I like it still. I'm, I, I actually, Kevin Smith really falls off for me after like, his first four films like I tried watching clerks three and I, I, I turned it off after 10. Minutes. Oh, I heard like, it was I couldn't awful. stand it. Um, I heard it was yeah, super Mon- sanctimonious. When, just... when Kevin when Kevin Smith stopped being so self-conscious, he started becoming very annoying to me. Like there, like there's a there's a there's a level in his early films where he's like kind of got a chip on his shoulder and kind of like has something to prove. And there's like a jadedness to it that I. I, I like appeals to me when it stops being that and he starts smoking a lot of weed, then I'm like, eh, okay, Kevin, this, this is a little getting a little self-indulgent here. He, yeah. He, his filmography is all over the place. Although I did like, um, his, when he kind of like dipped into like sort of like comedy horror, I liked, um, he, I, I really liked red state that film. Um, a lot of people didn't like that one. I really liked that one. I never saw red state. I saw tusk. Um, that was, tusk was, I, like, yeah, it was, was like a, kind of, it's okay. It's interesting. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um. So I mean, yeah. I, I like I like some of his films, but yeah, a lot of it to, he doesn't hold up as well. Like, not not compared to like Tarantino. I mean, Tarantino style has one hundred percent held up, um, over the years. Um, and it's gotten way better and way more refined. Um, like I I think the best film of his like in terms of quality is is One Spot of Time in Hollywood. I think that film is like perfect that, almost um that film has really so that's a perfect example of like honing so like, that's kind of like my issue with reservoir dogs where like it really felt like and that's kind of what made it so um it makes it so charming in a way where it's like you can tell like this is like you kind of get a feeling this is like a first time director just going balls it, to the wall th- th- just there's like, a lot there's a lot that's amateurish um looking back i i almost think but it's almost charming in a way. Yeah, I almost would have cut out a lot of the the stuff that's not them in the warehouse. Like it almost would have been more interesting if it took place entirely in one location. Um I was I was just thinking about that today where a lot of the flashbacks to like stuff. Like for example, the first flashback with Mr. Pink, you know, when it cuts back and it shows him running away, it doesn't like No, no it doesn't it doesn't that. that that sequence like and honestly, maybe if he hadn't had the full budget that he had and he, and he would have been forced to cut some of that stuff, I think it might have been a little bit better. I thought Mr. Orange's uh, flashback goes on a little bit long. Oh, yeah. That I would have cut I would have cut out like like the whole rehearsing the store, like the, the story thing he does with the handler. I think that kind of goes on too long. It's a. It's a great sequence, but that is Tarantino sucking his own dicks. So. Yeah, it's again, <laughs> I don't think Reservoir Dogs is his best film in terms of like execution, but there's just something that's so raw and appealing about it for me. And it yes. does feel like a, like a movie that anyone could make aside from, again, those flashy sequences. But like you could put this on as like a stage play. You could put this on as like a, a very simpler story. And I find that very appealing. Which to your point, that's kind of why I felt that's kind of why those like the flashback sequences almost kind of felt jarring where like this is supposed to be a stage play at its heart. It really is a stage play. I I almost think Tarantino is at heart a playwright um, who's kind of like got like because like even uh, the Hateful Eight is a a stage play, basically. Um, He's even talked about going back and making Reservoir Dogs like a play. And I think I think some people have adapted it as a play. I think they did like a like an all black um, or an all woman version as like a stage play. Um, so I don't know. But uh, if if anything, you could argue that not showing the flashbacks are more like so. For example, like Mister Pink's flashback, you could argue that us not seeing that would even be more interesting because then we have to question: Is he telling the truth? Like, or is he the rat? Maybe I don't know. Like, but at the beginning, we're kind of like, well, you know, he's not the rat. None of them actually really their flashbacks really add anything like Mr. White's flashback doesn't add anything. Mr. Blonde's kind of does in the sense that you're getting some hints that like there's something kind of wrong with this guy, um, right. but not but not really like it doesn't really yeah. do that. Like I 
I think the only thing it really adds to is the ending where, you know, uh, when Chris Penn kind of, that's why he doesn't buy Mr. Orange's story about Mr. Blonde being the rat. Cause he's like, this is a man who, you know, but it almost would be bias. more, it almost would be more of a shock if you didn't have that. And you're like, that's he reveals point. it yeah. right there. Um, I think you need the diner scene of obviously that's such a critical scene. Um, and you need, I think you need some of the planning a little bit. I think, I think we, I think we need to see like that meeting they have where they're giving out the names and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just entertaining. I just like those scenes, but yeah, it's a, it's a very, well, that's kind of Tarantino where like, that's sort of like an, a, a sign of sort of like a, early promising director where the sequences and scenes are interesting. They're good. But when you look, stand back and you're like how they all fit together. Um, however, I completely agree with you. I think once upon a time in Hollywood is almost the, I almost part of me thinks he's kind of been working towards that film, his entire career. Um, it was, it was a very sort of, it, it, it takes almost everything from, the sort of like comic vibe of like, you know, like Django and like, you know, Paul, F like all the com comedic aspects of it, it kind of emulates the sort of hangout vibe that he, cause that's kind of one of his favorite, you know, like uh Rio Bravo and um, days and confused, but then the ending, I think. And it was funny cause I actually thought I didn't like the ending at first because I thought it was a rehash of inglorious bastards, but rewatching it i actually think that it's it's taking what inglorious bastards did which in retrospect i think was more of just like kind of shock value it didn't really add anything to the film whereas the way once upon a time in hollywood ends is very purposeful in what it's trying to it's the, it's like a very very dark ironic twist um where it's almost sort of turning this awful event into sort of like a Hollywood-esque story and it's very dark and twisted. It's very cynical in a way. And it's a and it's a love letter to that era too. Mm -hmm. Like I I if this was his last film, like if, if he counted Kill Bill as two films and like this was the last one, I'd be very happy with it. Um although recently he said he uh he canceled um the movie critic. He's not doing that one anymore. Uh the one he was talking about as the final so we don't know what his final film is going to be. I'm, At least I, I don't know. It might they might have announced something, but I don't know it right now. I'm so glad that like it's so funny that like I thought we kind of got off topic there, um, but then I realized that no, we're perfect on topic because Quentin Tarantino is probably as talented as a filmmaker as he is. He is like the quintessential kind of person that I fucking hate. Um, he like sucks, you know. He like he's like he's been such a he's a huge proponent of film, which is fine. But he is the kind of person where like um, film is like objectively better. Fucking digital. I'll never shoot on digital. Like it's like that sort of like attitude. has he uh, has he never shot on digital before? I don't believe so. No, it's all been film. Um, I will say I will say, though, in Tarantino's defense, is he like that? Yeah, he's he's very much into like very obscure, like, you know, film like that. But. He's also someone who's very into like cheesy, like, um, like just like regular, like schlocky films too. The one stuff he doesn't seem to be into is kind of like Marvel and like, like that kind of stuff. But I don't think he's ever even, I think someone asked him about it one time. And I, I don't think he talked trash about it. I think he just he's, like, it just wasn't for him. He's not really, yeah, he's not super pretentious in terms of like his taste in film. Um, or I actually, I even actually think that part of him has praised some of the Marvel films where he like, he isn't like so far up his own ass about that. Um, what was the one recently, not recently, but like sort of that really bugged me about him. Oh, well, one thing is that I really think that like, I mean, again, his first run as a filmmaker, I love Kill Bill. And then from then on, he kind of you know, hit or miss. Hateful Eight was okay. I, I really think that his filmography suffered as a result of his ego, where people are like, oh, it's a Tarantino film. It's like, yeah, but I almost think that like at some point they became a, what's what I'm looking for? A, uh, a past, not pastiche. Uh, oh shit, what's the word I'm looking for? A self-parody. 
It's like Quentin Tino making a parody of Tarantino films at some point. I, I think um, some of the movies are guilty of that. I think some of them don't really actually like, like Hateful Eight actually is is the one that comes to mind, which I don't think it really, kind of Django too. I didn't feel, feel like those films really like, he didn't really do anything different other than the setting. The setting was different, but those films kind of didn't really add anything like new that we hadn't seen of him before. Like all of his films before that were kind of adding and like you kind of saw him doing some different stuff. Um, those two, I felt like when he was in his Western era, that kind of like it felt like his like style was stalling a little bit. Um, it kind of felt. Yeah, like the, it's a good point. I think that's kind of like a, why I like Kill Bill, where it was his first foray into like, you know, he had always been like on the nose about some of his references. But that was like the big one where he's like revenge, kung fu, violence and um and Inglorious Bastards, I always oh no, sorry, Glorious Django Bastards kinda like that, I guess, too. I mean I, I I love that film. It's just so entertaining, but that one also doesn't add that much. Um it's, until, until until he gets to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then I it really, felt like yes. then it felt like, okay, we're actually doing something similar to what we've seen before, but also it felt different. Like this felt like more intentional. It felt more heartfelt. It felt like this was coming from someplace deep within him. Um, and I, I like a lot of those movies too. Don't get me wrong. I like Django. I didn't love hateful eight. I thought it was okay. Um, I, I, I still think they're very entertaining films, but I do think that that era, it kind of stalled a little bit. Yeah. Even in glorious. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. Cause I think that's a perfect example of a film where like the individual sequences were great. But when I step back and I look at the film as a whole, I'm like, what? It's like, now, if that's kind of just what it was going for, that's fine. Um, but the, I, I, again, coming back to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, not only are the individual sequences of the film great, but they're all building to this inevitable conclusion that we know is coming. And then it pulls the rug out. And it, so that is, yeah, a perfect, like the way you said is like every thing, every interesting thing that he had like almost done in other films that weren't as good it all came together for this one and i'm almost that's well that's another thing too i think the whole 10 film limit fucking stupid like what is he like what do you what do we what like what like if like, again it's like you could do what you want but like why are we doing this i don't maybe and maybe now, that maybe that goes to the pretentiousness you were talking about maybe there's something to like he I mean, he's described it in a different way. He's described it like he he's he's getting out on his own terms rather than like a lot of audiences like they want to like reject you. They want you to keep going until they're tired of you. And then at that point, they're done with you versus going out on your own terms. That's how he's described it. Maybe there's something kind of pretentious about like. I have a 10 I have 10 movies in me and only 10 and it's like this this big kind of deal. Um Although I, I will say it does make it a little bit more interesting than some of these other directors, which you're like, you don't even think about it. You don't even think about like, oh, I mean, what's our next film going to be, you know? But with Tarantino, it's like there's a lot of hype and consideration behind like, oh, what is his final film going to be? What's what's his swan song, you know, going to going to be? Um, well, that's sort of why I almost well, this is like sort of weird where I almost think that he's shot himself in the foot because, you know. You know, it's like, oh, the movie critics going to be the last film. I almost wonder if he's gotten because he has set this, like, in my opinion, kind of silly limit for himself. Now he's in a position where, like, he's almost uh, what's what I'm looking for. He's almost like paralyzed himself, like of like anxiety of like, it's my last film. I have to make it the best one ever, you know. Um, and now he's just never going to make it because now he's like constantly second guessing himself about what he should do as the last film. And it's like, bro, just make the fucking movie. Just make a movie. <laughs> it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know though. Even though, even if it's kind of terrible though, I kind of am just like, this is the last thing, you know, we're going to, I mean, he said he's going to do other stuff too. You might do like a TV show. You might do like a podcast, but, but, um, but then to, to your point, if it is kind of like subpar, then is he going to like, like oh shit that was my last film i don't know he, I, again who knows like he could always be like yeah i'm doing another one and everyone's gonna be like yay there's this is, um uh i don't know if you listen if you've ever listened to logic the rapper um hmm. but he uh he he has this starting with his second album he has this like sci-fi story um 
going on where they're they're like people in the future listening to his albums and it carries through to the next album too and it's like oh put on put on the next logic album it's his last one and then everyone was like oh my god logic's next album is his last one um and then when it got to that album the 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 story that is like it continues off where it left off and it's like the guy's like what are you talking about his last album he's got a bunch of albums he's like oh yeah but it's the last uh of of this specific uh like like group of 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 albums so it's like he was he was kind of trolling the audience he was like yeah i'm not done making albums it's just the last in this particular group um so he might he might pull something like that but um uh yeah, who knows? I, I, I really don't know. Um, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see when when it eventually ever comes out. Who knows when that will be? We have some other cool stuff. Come, we have a lot actually coming out in September. We have Megalopolis, the uh, Francis Ford Coppola, which I'm calling it right now. I think it's going to suck. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think it's, it's going to be a disaster. Insane, right? Yeah. And I cannot wait. It's going to I great. can't. I think it'll be it'll be a very interesting train <laughs> whack. But just everything I've seen about the making of it screams to me like just like a shit show but who knows maybe it's one of those shit shows that just there there have been shit shows that produce like just this incredible work somehow um but i don't know a sci-fi epic where the the creator was smoking weed the entire time and you know i, I don't know i really don't know what's gonna happen well just a, have you seen a poster it's like am driver he's holding like a fucking Light engineering hammer. ruler yeah so, or oh is it is a that... hammer no, isn't no i think it like a... i think it's engineering i think you're right i think it's like a ruler like what <laughs> like what are we um, doing guys well he isn't he like an architect yeah but it's like it looks so like weird but i'm like okay like i don't know adam driver i can't really weird like look at this the film references the characters involved in the catalarian cat Catalan oh the Catalarian conspiracy yeah yeah i know a that. 63 beat like i'm like what <laughs> yeah this is gonna be this is gonna be insane um uh, but we'll see I'm, i don't know I'm excited. so we have that we have that coming out we have um for any of you who are sopranos fans the uh david chase documentary wise guy comes out next week oh, i'm yeah, looking forward cool. to that i'm gonna watch that um we have there was something else that's coming out this month too. Um, we're really looking forward to Anora. Did you see that? Um, it won best. It won the Palm Noir Can. Um, it's about a stripper who uh, meets a, a the son of a Russian oligarch at like at the club, and he pays her to be exclusive with him. Um, and. Uh, they end up getting married and like the Russian oligarch, his like, a family, they come to America and try to like break up the marriage. Um, it just looks really like irreverent and cool. And it won, it won the top award at Cannes. So we're all like, Oh shit. Uh, by Sean Baker. Uh, that's really good. Saturday night. I'm actually looking forward to, even though I kind of, am not, I don't think it's going to be very good. Uh, have you seen that? One? Have you seen the trailer for that one? No, I'm not. I've not really been paying attention. I've not really seen like seen any like movie like trailers come out recently. Um, yeah, so I'm not. I'm not familiar with movies that are coming out lately. Um, oh, this one. It's um. It it's like a dramatization of the opening night of SNL. Um, I have a feeling it's gonna be kind of toned down. Like someone's like, there's no like. You, we saw the whole trailer and no one's reeling cocaine, which everyone would have been reeling cocaine. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, oh, also, the thing I was trying to remember was the the Penguin, the TV show comes out uh, this month. Oh, yeah. I think I'm going to watch that. I really. Yeah, that'd be cool. Batman. I mean, I, we liked I yeah. liked the movie. Um, I liked uh, Colin Farrell. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. And, and, and everyone's like comparing it to The Sopranos because it kind of looks like he's like in therapy um, and he's doing like this tony soprano thing so we'll see we'll see how this uh how this turns out yeah but um yeah just to wrap up to bring it back around it's i think to your point i think you mentioned something that i really want to make clear is that like i'm even if you are someone who only watches like i i will admit there is part of me that's kind of like 
you know, like if you're really into film and you don't want to like broaden your horizons at all. But look, if you're someone who really just wants to watch like Disney and Marvel films and, you know, you're not like, you know, you're not super into film and you're just, you just like watching them. I think that's fine. I'm not going to like shame you for that. What drives me nuts, though, is that the people who like, you know, they'll say stuff like the Dark Knight's like the greatest film of all time. And it's like, OK, it's like. Like based on your filmography, sure, but like then when you kind of start, or then you call other people pretentious if they like a film before 1980, it's like that's when it kind of starts to, and th then it becomes this sort of caricature of older film as if all films made before 1980 are like dry and like boring and like just art, and all foreign films are just like shitty black and white art films, and it's like. No, and again, it almost like gets to a point where I'm like, this is like borderline offensive, bro. Like, you gotta chill. <laughs> but again, I think I think they do that though because so much like of the discourse is like, oh, if you like Marvel or Disney, you're a pleb and you don't know shit. And it's like, do I agree a little bit, kinda? But um, you know, it's at the end of the day, people watch what they watch. Like, I mean, a lot of people are really into anime. I'm not personally. I've been trying to like watch more stuff like that just to educate myself on the genre but like i anime just a lot of it just does not appeal to me in any single way um but i don't i don't know i don't i don't make it a point to shit on people for that even marvel and disney which i don't really love that type of stuff um if that's what makes you happy i mean entertainment we, we always like this is the stuff that you and me are kind of guilty of sometimes too which is we make entertainment more than what it is. And it's, it's just entertainment. It's just stuff for you to watch after work. You know, it's just, it's just stuff to, to put on and occupy yourself with for a while. Can it be more than that to some people? Absolutely. And I think for you and me, like art is not just like entertainment. It's like, there's a real appreciable meaning to a lot of this stuff for us. Not just, not just enjoying the movies, but like actually like, thinking about them and digesting them and really trying to absorb them in. Like I, I find that a very rewarding experience, but for other people, it's not other people have different interests. Video games are another type like that too, where it's like some people are really into video games, not just playing them, but like, again, analyzing them as like works of art and analyzing what the meaning is and all this stuff. And I like watching a lot of video essays that like do deep dives into, into video games. But for me personally, when I play, I, I'm not like, you know, trying to go that deep. I'm just like, oh, I got, you know, an hour to kill here. Let's play some World of Warcraft. Let's play some Minecraft, whatever. It's just passive entertainment for me to just occupy some time when I'm bored. So we all have different interests of what we do. Um, and if it, if some of this stuff doesn't appeal to you, that's totally fine. You live your life however you want to. But we across the board, there's like a judgment problem where people like are judging each other for, for their different beliefs and stuff like that. And I think that's where it starts to get toxic. And that's when you get to both sides kind of going at each other, calling films pretentious when they're not and calling films schlock when to the people who like it, you know, they just like it. So everyone should but, just fuck off. That's my point. Just fuck off. Basically. Well, it's weird because I think that's the point where it's like, I think what you were getting at was that even, but I think even like for us or others, I mean, at least I can say this personally. I mean, again, you, you can, and I, I, I presume this about you. Um, like, you know, I love Amadeus. If someone said they didn't like Amadeus, would I like jokingly like you pleb? Sure. Would it like personally offend me? Absolutely not. I would like, I do not care at all. However, it is, then there are people I've run into in the sphere where it absolutely, like this is where, you know, they, I could tell they're like, oh, you're like really into this, but not just like a fan, but like, you're like, I am personally invested in this. And if you say anything bad about it, it's like, we're going to have words. And it's like, that's, and I've even interacted with those people. And like halfway through the conversation, I realized that that's what's happening. And I get very, very uncomfortable because <laughs> I'm like, hey, bro, you know, we're talking just about like, 
movies, right? And they're like, excuse me? And I'm like, oh, shit. Dude. And that's what's funny. It's that's That side is almost universally on, like, the Marvel Disney side. Like, on the low... on the, if we, if we were arguing that like you know the the pretentious film side versus the the mass market side, it's always on the mass market side. Like that's sort even of what's even funny. pretentious even pretentious film people like they don't they'll judge you for liking Marvel or whatever, but they won't like if 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 you didn't like you know the stupid French film, they don't they don't really care that much other than just calling you a pleb. Like it's not like a personal like. They don't I don't I don't I've never seen that happen where people get offended like that. But on the other side, I've seen absolutely like if you don't like anime, which I have a lot of anime like fans oh, yeah. in my thing. And when I talk shit about it, they get so mad. And I, I'm always jokingly talking shit. I don't actually I, I don't actually judge people for liking anime. I like some anime. But um, yeah, there is that side where it's like. And again, maybe maybe they because of the way we kind of talk about it sometimes, maybe they feel it's like an attack on them. Maybe they feel like you're kind of putting them down when you don't like it. Um, I don't think that's that's a fair judgment, but that might be what's going on. Or sometimes I almost feel like, well, because that's the thing. That's what's so weird is like I see whenever people are like there's this stereotype of like, oh, the film bro who like says they love this like. 19th century silent film to feel pretentious um i I almost think that's like a straw man like i I, i've have i like met a few people like that maybe but like it is it's weird how like people frame it as if like oh this is like totally like a thing that happened it's like not really most of the i don't i don't think i don't think to that extreme i don't i don't think it's like silent films from the from the 1900s or whatever do i feel though that some people put up like 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 they say Akira Kurosawa is their favorite director when it's like are, is it actually like your favorite director or do you like Seven Samurai and you kind of just put up Akira Kurosawa because it sounds kind of cool um but, I think that happens a lot but see I don't even know though because like I, I think we were talking about that I, I actually think I respond to someone um in uh, on Twitter they mentioned that like oh people who like I don't know who was it. Oh, it was uh, Bill Maher. Um, on his show, he said something along the lines of like, "Oh, is Akira Kurosawa one of those directors that people pretend to like to you know think they're important?" And it just kind of was frustrating because like, so, kind of similar to Hitchcock, that's a perfect example of a director who like, I think a lot of people assume that like Kurosawa is some like. What's the look? What I'm looking for? Um, inaccessible, very pretentious director. Where he like really like all of his films are unbelievably accessible, like insanely so. I wasn't saying though that like that that film was pretentious or anything like that. But yeah. I, am I saying though that like I chose that because it sounds good? It sounds like something that would impress people. I think that happens a lot. Um, yeah, and not, but- not maybe not specifically to Kurosawa, but like I I think that like. Or, or like A24, like there's a lot of people that like, it's not just that the movies are good or whatever, but the fact that it's coming from that label, which is at, at this point, like this very kind of critically acclaimed thing and it's got like some weight to it. I think that adds to people's like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put this film up as like my favorite film ever and, and, or, or a film I'm really liking right now. And it's not, it's not that it's a hundred percent disingenuous, but it just kind I think people people want to make it seem a little bit more than what it is. You know what I'm saying? They're trying to like impress people a little bit. It's not that it's a lie. It's just kind of, I I think people exaggerate sometimes. But then the, but then this is like where this is like where I get frustrated. It's like, at what point do we like, at what point does that become incredibly like, um, not disingenuous, like almost insulting in a way where it's like, Oh, Hey, this is my favorite film. It's like, well, it's not really. You're just kind of saying that to kind of like it's like I almost gets to because like the issue with that is like, well, how do I dis how do I disprove that? It's your it's it's an accusation without you that is impossible to disprove. Like I'm sure some people would even say that about me and Amadeus. Like that is genuinely my favorite film, or or even a perfect example for yours. Once upon a time in the West, you could say. um, Oh, come on. You're really saying that's your favorite film? 
like no country for old men's like way better you're just saying that you love that film because you're you kind of want to seem cool and like no you wanna I, maybe up. maybe some people would say that i think i think i picked like the most mainstream um sergio leone film to, to i mean i guess i guess maybe good to bad and ugly is the more mainstream choice but funny uh, just to interrupt it's funny you say that because austin butler got shit on for that he was called out for that where he said oh he picked the good he he picked the good and bad and ugly as one of his, like his favorite films and people roasted him like oh he's just saying that to be pretend and it's like bro that's like no <laughs> like that is yeah such i a, mean that's literally the most like mainstream normie shit on a, like most accessible like yeah that's but so that's kind of where I get it, it gets it kind of bothers me where it no gets you're to the point I mean where, I I I understand yeah. your point I think I think it is a straw man but I do think like film like like the letterbox crowd can be very pretentious and I like I said I don't think it's outright lies most of the time I just think there is a there is a sense of like kind of um what's the word not uh, you're you're trying to like uh like create an image of yourself that's very like like you're, like you're very proud of like it's it's very like you try to present yourself in a certain way it's not that i think people are outright lying about the films they like but i do think that like they're trying to create an image of themselves and i think that's what some people are calling out sometimes and again maybe it's not true maybe it's not that's not a fair critique but um i don't know i think i think people do tend to paint a picture of themselves as being very like artistic and very, you know, deep about this stuff when it is, it is just movies. Even, even if what you like is obscure or whatever, it's just a film, you know? Well, that's, I think that's kind of what bugs me is that like, again, I'm someone who is like, it is someone I, I'd say I'm, I have a pretty good grasp of like, you know, film history, like, you know, world, world directors. Do. Um, so it really bugs me when someone's like, like someone will say something like, Oh yeah, the good and the bad, the ugly, like he's just picking obscure films. And it's like, <sighs> like, th- like that's what? like the most norm normie shit ever. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, he, you know, if you've watched a Quentin Tarantino film, you probably have seen good and bad, the ugly because yeah. that's his favorite film. And he talks about it. It's like, yeah, it, that's kind of where it gets to the point where I'm like, not only, yeah, not only, Again, if someone really did say, "Oh, this silent film from the 19th century is my favorite film," yeah, you know, I think that then you could kind of be like, "Okay, that's a little." Although strange. I will say, in in that in that defense, um, City Lights is actually one of my favorite films. I think it's, it's a, a very f- fun fun movie. Like even as a silent film, it's like it's fun. Like I, I enjoy well, it. Well, that's and that's another issue where it, I it kind of creates this impression, particularly with foreign films, and this is it, it where it low key becomes almost like racist or xenophobic, where people almost like presume. I think I posted you you mentioned my community page because of that. I posted like a list of all the letterbox French films I saw, and they were like there was horror, there was drama, there was comedy, there was. It's got this, but because people because they don't know that because they haven't watched like any, if at all French films, um, all they think of is like, Oh, it's just people smoking cigarettes in black and white. It's like, there are some of that. Sure. Um, but that is a drop. Like the French, the French film, it was the harbinger for the French extremist movement in the early two thousands, the goriest fucking movies you have ever horror movies you've ever seen martyrs high tension inside um so yeah it, it just frustrates me particularly when for people who are who claim to be lovers of film where the fact that they just write off entire nations of cinema where i don't think like, i don't think any of those people claim to be lovers of film i think they they just like what they like which is well, yeah, I, I, maybe, mm. maybe, maybe we're stereotyping too. When we always we always say they're Marvel and Disney lovers, it's like, but that's, see, that might be that might be a its own version of like a stereotype. But see, it to some extent maybe. But what I think my point was that kind of person is like ten times more common on like 
in, on in terms of like film Twitter, social media, than the inverse of the sort of character they built. Like it's the guy who's like, yeah, man, I'm like passionate about film and storytelling. And like their top five films are like Fight Club and The Dark Knight. And it's like, that's fine. Those are great movies. But okay, you know, let's, yeah. Stop, stop calling Mac pretentious on Twitter. That's the, that's the main, that's the main. <laughs> it topic wasn't, here. it wasn't even me. I know, I, think, I know. I think even my film taste is pretty normy by, um, cause like I, I kind of agree. There are a lot of like older films that are kind of boring. Um, but it's I mean, when it, I, between the two of us, though, um, I'm, I'm when it comes to the film, I'm the normie and you're the pretentious film douche. So, yeah, but we're like, again, it's like political, like you and me are like here, like here and here. And then there's the people over here that we're talking about. <laughs> all right. We've hit our hour here. So um, thank you all for for listening to this and uh, stay tuned for the next one coming soon. Take care, y'all.